Great. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you, um, Samantha, so much for... Where's Samantha? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for, for the invite to come down. We had uh, toured down here in October um, and just thought what everybody was doing here within the Parkinson's Voice um, program and project was just such a, an awesome, awesome thing. And I was really thrilled to be able to get the invite to come down here and, and talk to you all. Um, Anne, if you could stand up so we can see where Anne is in the, in the crowd. And so uh, I will have Anne come up at the, uh, at the end. I'll give um, kind of the rundown of, of what we're doing and get into some of the, a little bit of the science and the mechanistic stuff. And because I always feel it's important to address why it is we're doing what we're doing. And I'm not going to try to sell it as, even though it was announced as a therapy, it is an experimental procedure. We are studying it. We would like to, if it is successful, we would like it to become a part of a routine therapy if that's possible. But we have a lot of work to do to get there. But this is going to be somewhat to understand why we're doing what we're doing. And hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about uh, what is happening with Parkinson's disease. How do we think about it? How do we begin to approach this very kind of complex uh, problem? Um, so to start into it, let's see if we get this uh, right here. Oh, let's do this. There we go. Um, you all have heard about, you know, if you have an idea, you kind of have to prepare your elevator speech, right? And they say you've got to be able to, so the idea is if you walk into an elevator and somebody goes, what are you doing? You've got to be able to tell them what it is you're doing, right? So get in the elevator. Somebody next to you says, oh, so what are you working on? Oh, well, uh, I work with patients with Parkinson's disease, right? And they're treated with medications. But as their disease progresses and the medication doesn't work so well, uh, we turn to deep brain stimulation, which also treats the symptoms but still doesn't stop the progression because the problem is nothing stops the progression with Parkinson's. So we have this idea what if we could take a patient's own cells to help repair the brain? So at the time of deep brain stimulation, we take a nerve out of around the ankle and we put it into the brain and we hope that it's going to help to repair the cells and reduce uh, the progression or stop the progression of Parkinson's disease. And then the elevator door is open and they, <laughs> they said, oh, that's different. <laughs> Have a nice day. Um, and so from that standpoint, this is the, the challenge. If we get, there we go. Right? Easy. Just flip the switch and we've, we've solved the problem. And the, one of the and favorite quotes I have is from uh, Yanir Bar-Yam, who is a uh, kind of co-founder of the New England Complex Systems Institute, a big sounding name, but they study really complex problems. Uh, brilliant guy. And one of the things that he likes to say is that the complexity of a solution must match the complexity of the problem. Makes sense, right? But so we really have to kind of understand all those details. It just says that there's no shortcuts. Once you understand it, you might be able to engineer something or figure out a more efficient way to do it, a faster way to do it. But in order to solve the problem, the complexity must match the complexity of the problem. So enough with the elevator speech. Let's, I, that's basically what I'm going to take you through, um, where we are with Parkinson's disease, how we think about it, and this idea of trying to repair the brain with cells from your own body. So what is Parkinson's disease? There are many different components to it. Uh, it's mysterious. So when you were first getting diagnosed, do I really have it? Do I not? Was it really clear? And if I really do have the symptoms, is it truly idiopathic Parkinson's disease, garden variety, or is it maybe some other form and it's just Parkinsonism? You know, is it going to progress? Is if it doesn't, then it's not Parkinson's, right? So there can be other things that happen that go along that look like Parkinson's but are, are really not. And that 
It's important because if it's not, some of the treatment strategies that we have really aren't going to work so well. It's complex, as I mentioned. There are a lot of moving parts. Every one of you in this room are different. When, when was your onset? Where did it start? How fast is it progressing? What medications are you on? How well do you respond to them? Everybody's different. Do you have tremor? Some patients don't have any tremor. Some patients only have tremor, mostly. Right? So there's quite a bit of variety. And we don't know what causes all of that. It's elusive. Right? Some patients do respond well. Other patients can't tolerate the medications. And it changes, and patients fluctuate day in and day out. It's stealthy, right? It, it hides. It's in a, the area that we know is affected in the brain is deep within the brain. It's hard to get to. It's hard to study. There are no good animals of the natural progression of Parkinson's disease. There are no good animal models of this. So we have patients that we can study, but we're limited as to what, what, we, can, what we can do. And it's a thief. It robs people of their quality of life, their ability to work day in and day out. And it affects the family, and it takes people's and patients' time and energy and emotions. And it's relentless, right? We don't have anything FDA approved that stops the progression of the illness, really. So in a lot of ways, that's what I think of as kind of the holy grail. What can we come up with that can either slow down stop or reverse the progression. So I'll take you through some of the strategies and some of the thoughts of why we're working the way we are. So here's uh, one of the basic graphs uh, as a summary of what happens with Parkinson's. And often when you, you may start off with constipation, REM sleep disorder problems, hypo, hypomimia, depression, cognitive things, and you don't even have any motor symptoms yet. So people are looking very hard at what are some of the early signs that may tip us off that, we may, that someone may be having Parkinson's. Because if we can get to it early, we're going to be much better off, as you'll see, than if we wait. And then once the symptoms start to begin, then they continue to get worse. And you get motor symptoms, you have non-motor symptoms, orthostatic hypotension, urinary symptoms, some dementia, and you get motor complications from the medications themselves. Dyskinesias, fluctuations, on-off, freezing. Right? So again, complex set of uh, issues that progress over time. The symptoms, as I talked about, Tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, gait difficulty, the main features, and again, some patients ha may have more that are predominant uh, than others. Some may start with tremor, and then other symptoms come in. Um, and it's quite, again, it's quite progressive. And what is it that leads to this progression? And that next on the bottom right, cell death over time. The one thing that we do know is that there are cells deep within the brain that are slowly, or in some patients more quickly, dying off fairly selectively. They're not the only ones, but through history and what we know most about are these dopaminergic neurons in a little area of the brain called the substantia nigra. And at autopsy, if you look at patients who have Parkinson's versus somebody who does not, why do we call it the substantia nigra? It's the black substance, right? So if you look at that slide in the upper left, a patient who is a control patient, uh, control um, subject, you can see these dark little wings here, and those, that's the dark pigment melanin, and uh, that's why they call it the substantia nigra, because you can see with your naked eye that it's dark, and a patient that has Parkinson's disease, that's missing. So that was the first clue to say, oh, well, it must, something must be going on in the substantia nigra. And when they looked at this area more specifically under a microscope and counted how many cells are dying off, 
and they took a number of patients, and then they looked at their symptoms, they found a direct correlation between the amount of cell loss and the degree of symptoms and the severity of symptoms. So there's a good correlation of kind of as a target area of something is going on in this area. What can we do about it? But then you'll ask, okay, so these cells are dying off. Why? And that's the million dollar question. We don't necessarily know. Is it alpha-synuclein accumulation of a protein? Patients will often say, well, what about genetics? And if you look at this kind of complex figure here, you see genetic components on either side. But if you look at the numbers, maybe 10 to 15% of patients will have a family history and a genetic link to Parkinson's. And I go, oh, well, that's a clue. But it also tells you that 85 to 90% of patients don't, right? So it's a clue, but it doesn't, doesn't tell the whole story. So these cells have something going on with them, could be a wide range of possibilities, which leads to what we call apoptosis. It's a cell mechanism that when they're sick, that's the, that pathway onto them dying off. And then when they do die off, we call it neurodegeneration. So how do we stop this? That's what we're going to talk about. So that process where the cells are dying off, um, we'll call it the sick neuron hypothesis. Okay. So before the cells die off, they go through a phase where they're not doing so well. They're dysfunctional whether they've got abnormal levels of protein, something, they're sick and they're not doing well. And along this gradient then, you've got on the top normal, slight, mild, moderate, and severe. Pretty standard type rating scale. Healthy cell up top and puts out that dopamine, right, as a neurotransmitter. So when you take your cinemet, right, the cinemet is taken up and is converted into dopamine. That's the, that's the treatment strategy right now when you take your medications. So when you start to advance a little bit and you've got some loss of the dopaminergic tone, symptoms might be slight, you might be diagnosed. You're having symptoms, they may try some medication as your symptoms become a little bit more mild. Do you respond or not? That's also a clue. Once the medications aren't working so well and you have more of this as a problem, with the cells, if symptoms are more moderate, then we start to think about deep brain stimulation. Because the medications work to a certain degree, but then we try other medications, and then you have side effects from the medications, and then medications that take care of the side effects of the medications, and then what else do we got? So we, deep brain stimulation is not experimental, it's been FDA approved for nearly 20 years. Uh, and it, it works very well and it's durable. Then at the severe stage, supportive, right? Again, we don't have anything to stop that process. So what does that tell us? How can we interfere or inter intervene with this? And I'll go into a little bit more about strategies Right, so if we're at that level of saying we need to get into that area and try to rescue what we can, how do we do that and how do we think about that again? So we had, we're just looking at one neuron and that neuron got sick and then it eventually died off. But let's put that neuron in with its neighbors and I'm gonna put it here in this middle row of the green cells that I call the substantia nigra, okay? So the two components of that, you have a whole row of healthy cells and each of those is a very simplistic model, but each one of those cells has an input and it's got an output. So that shows connectivity, right? So the brain, for the most part, respects kind of broad channels of functionality. So that's part of the connect connectivity. And what parts of the brain are connected to other parts and what are their neighbors is important because that actually then represents different parts of your body. So every part of the brain is going to do something that represents part of your body. 
So that needs to be organized in a, in a way in the brain. So I put this up here just to kind of demonstrate that there are these rows and channels because I think in part of attacking this problem, the connectivity is gonna be very important. So what happens? So some of the cells begin to get sick. So we get four of those on the left-hand side. And if you notice, for their connectivity, the cells that they talk to are now functioning differently. So that's one territory. Symptoms might be mild, might get diagnosed. Maybe you're starting on some uh, medications. As that progresses, now you've got some cell loss. And in that mid-range, you have more sick cells, but you have some that are still okay. It's not all of them die off. And I think that in garden variety Parkinson's disease, this, having these cells that are still around, that are sick, still play into the therapy. They can still do things. They just need help. They can still take and use Cinemat up to a certain point. So that's why the medication is, can be effective. And one of the clues to that is in this next slide. There are no sick cells, but some of them are missing. So how does that happen? And one of the things that can lead to that is what we call vascular Parkinsonism. So you can have small strokes, areas that don't get enough oxygen, those cells die off. But if it's because they don't get oxygen, they can die off quickly. They don't go through a sick phase. And you're left with healthy neurons, and then you're left with some that are gone. And these patients also tend not to respond very well to Cinemet at all. And then, in fact, in the clinic, that's one of the clues. If we have a patient who has a lot of Parkinson's symptoms, oh, well, what medications are you taking? Well, I take Cinemet, you know, but it doesn't do anything for me. I might get a couple of points of improvement here and there, but day in and day out, I really don't, it doesn't really help me out. And then you look at the MRI and you look and say, oh, there's some evidence that something is going on with the vasculature. So, they, those patients don't respond well to medication, they don't respond well to deep brain stimulation. And if we identify them in the clinic, we don't implant them with DBS because we know that they're not gonna get as good a response as we would like, depending on their symptoms. So, one way to approach this problem, it's been popular around for 30 years, so if those cells are missing, why don't we just replace them, right? Why can't, can't we transplant something back into the brain and, and replace them with, with other neurons? So where would you get those? And that's one of the fundamental problems of cell transplantation if you're trying to transplant neurons. The central nervous system is very finicky and the only cell that will survive if you transplant it, a brain cell, and if you transplant it into, back into the, another brain, are fetal cells, right? So morally and ethically quite a dilemma. Uh, there were some clinical trials that went on in the 80s. They, in Europe, they just recently resurrected that trial. Um, it would require multiple uh, fetal donations, aborted fetuses, to take the, the cells, to harvest them, to implant, just on one side and then they'd have to come back and get it done on the other. Uh, not that they were really looking to say that this is gonna be the next wave of curing Parkinson's, but can it at least show proof of concepts, concept? And to some degree, you can get some symptomatic improvement, but again, it's extraordinarily difficult to do. The whole clinical trial in Europe over uh, several years uh, only got a fraction of, of what they wanted to get they had many canceled surgeries. Patients got in, into the operating room. We don't have enough cells, we can't do it. So in terms of feasibility, which is a big issue and it's one of the things we'll talk about, um, not a great option. But even if it was, there's another problem, I think. So if you look at that, where do you put the cells? And you have to pick one place. So. Imagine, I said connect, connectivity is important. So when I talk about these brain cells and you're kind of like, 
I, I take it most of you have not seen a whole lot of brain cells in your in your day to day working. Um, so let me give you a, a kind of an idea of why I think this is so important. So imagine I had a basketball, right? And that was the that's the cell, and, so, and it's that's the cell body, but it's going to communicate with other parts, say within the building, and so it has a wire that comes out of this basketball, and it goes out the door and down the hall and all the way around to the back of the building and into another room, right? And that's what a neuron does. It's got its cell body and it sends out a long process a long way away to another part of the brain. So that cell goes away. How do I get that reconnected? That's why I think connectivity is important. And this is also one of the, what makes this complex and difficult is that the brain is really bad at repairing itself. Spinal cord injury, stroke, traumatic brain injury, it's permanent, right? We, the brain does not repair itself. So if I put the cells down here, and so, okay, we say the fetal cells are not a good choice. You know, well, what about stem cells, right? That, those have to hold a lot of promise, right? They've got the same problem. You can get them. They can survive. How are you going to get them connected? Do you want them to act like a dopamine pump? Or do you want to really rebuild the circuitry? You can get them to work as a little bit of a dopamine pump, but I'm thinking you probably need the connectivity to restore the function that you want. And so whether you put the cells here or there, where the cell bodies were, you still have the same problem. How do you get it connected to where you need it to be connected to? So after giving that a lot of thought, we say, well, there's, maybe there's something else. What else can we try? What if we took cells to not replace cells, but what if we put cells in to help repair the cells that are sick? And maybe they could also pr provide some support to the surrounding cells so they didn't get sick. Or if they did, they would be better taken care of. So there are cells, support cells in the brain, oligodendroglia, and those are the, the glial cells, the support cells, and they help out the neurons that surround them. They're the ones that are really not very good at repair. So for a neuron to repair itself, it needs some support and it needs some help. And the glial cells inside the brain don't do a very good job. So where would we get some support cells that are going to do a good job at this? And in my elevator speech, I mentioned something about taking something out of your leg, a piece of a nerve. So why would we do that? As opposed to the central nervous system, the nerves in the rest of the body, the peripheral nervous system, they're really good at repairing themselves. If you cut a nerve in your arm and the ends are together, those axons can cross that gap, go back into the nerve, go down to where that they were going to innervate. It's as if I had that basketball and I cut the process off and it grew another one and it followed the conduit all the way back to the back room. It may take a while, but it can do it. It's not perfect, but it can do it. And the reason that it can do it is that it supports cells in the peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells, they're glial cells, they're special. They do something much different than the support cells in the brain. Evolutionarily, I can't tell you why, but we'll take what we can get. So this is the peripheral nerve, and if you break it down into its components, and after injury, you've got that blue cell which has now turned itself into a repair cell. Okay. This is a bit of a busy slide, but that's the process in the upper left-hand corner. Peripheral nerve gets cut. The support cells, which were doing its maintenance, fu maintenance function, certain cell type, they go through genetic reprogramming. And if you look at the genes, what's red is upregulated. What's blue is downregulated. We can, we can study that. So we know that there are significant genetic changes that are going on in those cells after injury. 
So these cells become something different, and they produce growth factors and a host of other things. So we know that, and that's what we're looking for as part of this. That was shown in animal studies. So you can study those in, in rats and in primates. It's, it's much more difficult to study that in patients, but because of the trial that we have, <coughs> excuse me, where we're taking peripheral nerve tissue out and putting it into the brain, we have an opportunity to study that change because we actually delay it by two weeks. So when we, we took six patients who went through this process, we looked at the nerve when it was freshly cut. When we went back in two weeks later for the nerve harvesting, we took another piece, we put some of it into the brain, we took the other piece and we sent it to the laboratory for comparison and we said, what happens in that two weeks? What are the differences? And you can look, so across the top, each one of those columns is a patient and each one of the rows is a different genetic factor that we look at. And I don't, this isn't gonna be a lecture on all the genetics and, and switching, so the main parts to take off if it's red, it's going up. It, it increases by twofold. If it's blue, it's being decreased by another twofold. If you didn't see any change, then we'd say the cells are staying the same. They're the same cell that when we, when we got it. So how much change is going on it, at the human level? This is what we call transdifferentiation. So for a cell type to be a cell type, it's gonna express a certain set of genes. And if it changes that type, we can see what those changes are. And one of the things I was really surprised about is that how consistent it was from, this doesn't look, I mean, it looks a little busy, but there's a red area and there's a blue area. And that happens with all those patients, all same patients, so it's very consistent. It's only six patients, but it's very consistent for the ones that we have. So we know there's a lot of changes and these are these differentiating um, and developmental genes that are being switched. We said that the cells are support cells. They provide insulation for the neuronal wiring, if you will. And that insulation is called myelin. And so what this slide shows is that when you look at the myelin, those cells stop making their maintenance protein. Right? So we know that they're switching. Growth factor activity. Some go up, some go down. Doesn't, it's not as important, but again, just to the fact that you're seeing these changes. And this one is all red. 128 different genes, all red, all upregulated. And these are cell survival genes, cell survival factors, okay? So the idea is if we can get these cells and after a nerve injury, after a cut, put them into the brain two weeks later, and if they're doing these kinds of things, can they help out the dopamine neurons in the brain for patients with Parkinson's? So how do we do that? If we were going to do that, how are we gonna do that? So this is kind of a organized slide Lower left-hand corner, yes, we go close to the ankle. Why do we go to the ankle? There is a sensory nerve, the sural nerve, that runs in that area. It's not a motor nerve, so if we cut it, you may develop some numbness, but you're not gonna have any motor deficits. Right? If I cut a motor nerve, then you wouldn't be able to move that part of the body where the nerve went to. So this is a sensory nerve. It's a safe area to take a nerve. If you go to the neurologist and they say, oh, we think you're having a peripheral nerve problem, we better get a biopsy. That's where you go to get a biopsy. Standard neurosurgical procedure has been around for years. And yes, it's not risk-free. There's always a risk of infection. You're gonna have some numbness because we actually take a segment out of the nerve. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but we can take that segment out and safely and without a significant deficit. We tease out the fascicles because it's a nerve, but it has a bunch of nerve cables within it, and we take those out, and we cut those into smaller pieces. We load them into a cannula. They're the dimensions on the, right, up, the upper right of what that looks like. And then that's what we use to implant into the brain. How do we do that? Oh, 
Okay. So uh, now we're getting into stereotactic surgery and deep brain stimulation territory. Most of these things are how we've learned about this. If we're going to try to target something in the brain specifically, we better know where we are. We better know how, how to get there with precision and accuracy. Okay? So back in the 50s, stereotactic frames were being invented. And the design that we use today is actually very similar to the very same principles. Very solid, sturdy frames. There are different versions. I'm old school. I know how it works. I know the precision. We can be within a millimeter and a half of where we need to be within the brain. And I can do that with confidence, because I've done it over and over. But the, the frame and the way you do it is very important. And this is a quick picture of how, how that happens. So we have a patient, we put the frame, and yes, it goes onto the patient's head. And some, sometimes we do the surgery with the patient's awake, and sometimes, right now, we do that almost always uh, asleep. But we put that frame on the head, and it does their pins, and it keeps it in place relative to the skull. And then we put what we call the birdcage, these fiducial markers, onto that frame. We put them in a scan. So now we've obtained a scan with a frame on the head with these fiducial markers. And we can put that into a computer, and we can generate a three-dimensional space of your brain, an X, Y, and Z coordinate system. And now if we could just overlay MRI data of your brain into that space, and I can say, I want to be there in this spot on the MRI, this will allow me to get there. So that's why this looks the way it does. There's the CT scan three-dimensional reconstruction patient with a frame on the skull and those bars that are shown. So using that technology, we can cut away part of that on the images, part of the skull, and you can see a trajectory coming down into some deep targets within the brain. And there's more of a cutaway view. And that's relatively, for that patient, where we need to be for targeting that part of the brain. And that's why it's called deep brain stimulation. Not superficial, it's, it's, it's deep, okay? And if we can, and these are to scale, right? So this is from a patient, that's the, the cannula, the marker, those are all to scale, which is important. So we can't look at an area of the brain and look at this little tiny dot and go, that's where I wanna be. It's, if I'm going in there with a cannula, transplant cannula, or a deep brain simulating electrode, I need to know the size of that because it, it makes a difference. So, funny looking structure that relates to both deep brain stimulation and our transplantation. How many people have heard of the basal ganglia? Right? Yeah, that's right. Excellent. So you're all, I don't need to go over this then, right? Okay. Um, so it's color coded. This is, this is the basal ganglia, most of it. Um, or as uh, one of our residents likes to call it, the, the bar fruit coloring. So you've got the orange on the outside, the lemon, and then the lime wedge right in the middle. Putamen, globus pallus, external segment, globus pallus, and internal segment. GPI, the region we target for deep brain stimulation. The lower green area is part of the substantia nigra. Oh, well, that's the part where the dopamine cells are. There are two parts to it. One part does not have the dopamine cells in it, and the other part does. There's a pars compacta, and there's a pars reticulata. Basically, there are two parts. This is the part that does not have the dopaminergic cells, and then you've got this purple structure, the subthalamic nucleus. So another good target for deep brain stimulation. Works very well for patients, depending on patient selection. And if you can get the electrode there, in the right way. So where are those dopaminergic neurons? I'll lay that one there. There. So it's kind of like if you just layered on a piece of toast, some raspberry jelly. Or if you're a millennial, avocado, right? <laughs> so I, I'm old school, so I went with the raspberry jelly. 
But that's where, the, that's where we want to target if we want to get to the dopaminergic region. Okay? But wait, there's more. How is this organized? So this is some of the new technology with the imaging that we've been using for our deep brain stimulation. So these are fiber pathways. So these are fiber pathways that are originating or involved with the cerebellum, also important for coordinating planning movement. So these fiber pathways, if we said on the left side of the brain, what, ha what is going through this area? And there, I color coded them. There's purple, yellow, green, and blue. What do those rep represent? Those, I can see if I highlight those and they, those fiber tracks, I can see where they project onto the cortex of the brain. As I said, the brain is organized in different ways. So that purple is sensory information. The yellow is motor. The green goes to the premotor area. So motor area is primary moving, command and control. The green premotor, planning your movement, coordinating your movement. The blue, we think, looks like it's projecting to the supplementary motor area, SMA. So what is that? It has to do with speech. So I was really interested when I saw that. One of the potential side effects from Parkinson's, it affects your speech, right? We're all here, right? One of the potential side effects from deep brain stimulation, disrupt disruption of speech. Verbal fluency, getting your words out, especially in the area of the subthalamic nucleus. And this is why I think that happens, is if your electrode is a little too, close, too far anterior and you stimulate that area, you're going to get speech problems. Okay? So this is why I think it's important to begin to map out all of these. So any of our patients who get deep brain stimulation, we map them out. All of, our scan, all of our patients now get scans with sedation, 3T MRI, with fiber tracking. So we can, we can map everybody out, where are our electrodes, what are side effects, what are the areas that are working. Gives us very important information. And if it all goes well, we've mapped everything out and we want to target the, sub, the substantia nigra with a graft. This is what it would look like. This is from a patient, two views, one from the side, one looking directly on. That little green or teal cylinder represents where a graft is within the nigra. Okay? So that would be, okay, that's the idea. Can we get that nerve tissue from the ankle into that area? Again, that's, again, that's a lot. We put on a frame, that's, that's a big deal, right? But... What if we did it at the same time we were doing deep brain stimulation? That's the idea behind DBS plus. You get your DBS, and at the same time you're getting that surgery, we can take the graft, the nerve graft, and implant it into the brain. You don't have to have additional surgery. You get your deep brain stimulation, you donate your own tissue, and then you can be part of the trial. And it doesn't interfere in any way with your deep brain stimulation therapy. Okay. So if we were going to do that, what's that gonna look like? Well, we are doing it, that's why I'm here. Um, here are the study protocol details. So we said, okay, let's get this up and going. These are, that's why I made the point that it's not a therapy, this is a, a trial. Exploratory phase one clinical trials, primary outcomes focused on feasibility and safety. Can we do it, because it hasn't been done in this way, and is it safe? Right? We've got to be able to show that. If something worked really great, but the surgical risk was so high, not going to work. So we've got to show safety and we've got to show feasibility. Open label, non-blinded. This is not a double-blind, controlled, randomized, you know, multi-center trial. So pilot studies, small studies, small number of patients, um, and, it's, and people know if they're getting a graft or not. Okay. 
It's investigator initiated. It's our own idea. There's uh, no corporate sponsor. There's no intellectual property. Okay. Um, we're moving forward with philanthropy, donations, and some internal support. No conflicts of interest are related to this work. I have consulting contracts. We share information. Medtronic, Boston Scientific, Abbott, Brain Lab, but none of those influence any of this work in any way. So this is a clinical trial. We have oversight. We have IRB approval. We have a data and safety monitoring board that we report all of our adverse events to every four months. We have consulted with the FDA. And because patients use their own tissue, we only resize or reshape it. We don't do anything else to it. It's not genetically modified. We don't add chemicals to it. Pure saline, resize it, put it in a cannula that's off the, basically off the shelf. And we implant it at the same time we're doing a surgery. The tissue never leaves the operating room. It never leaves the sterile field. So when we consulted with the FDA, they said, well, you fall under the exemption. We don't, we don't need to monitor that. Okay? That was our big step to be able to move forward. These are clinical trials. They're registered at clinicaltrials.gov. Here are the numbers. This is all open stuff. Anybody wants to look at it, we'll get you all the information that you want. Um, and there's the uh, FDA same procedure exemption. Patient selection. So who's a good candidate for this? So this is safety and feasibility. For patients who have idiopathic Parkinson's disease that were consented for deep brain stimulation to treat their, sim their motor symptoms, said, okay, we will begin the screening process. And as long as you don't have any other significant cognitive issues, Parkinson's disease, dementia, uh, MCI, um, cognitive impairment, you can move forward if everything is clear. Okay. So again, I can provide all these uh, bits of information to you, but it was relatively open and not that restrictive. Age range, 40 to 75. Study timeline. For this part of the details that I'm going to talk about was for a design for 24 months, two years. The deep brain stimulation surgery is done in two stages, stage one and stage two. We stage them two weeks apart. Stage one, pulse generator, connector wires. Stage two, the deep brain stimulating electrodes. For the study, stage one, we go and we cut the nerve and we take a piece of it for the laboratory. That distal part is now undergoing that transformation, upregulating growth factors, becoming repair cells. We go back in two weeks later when we do, after we implant the electrodes and the whole system's set up, we go in and we take a piece, go back in, and we take a piece of that nerve that has undergone this reconditioning. Evaluation, six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years. And we do some clinical evaluations, we do some imaging. But patients are treated as Parkinson's patients with DBS. They get programmed, your medications are not held or manipulated. We do hold them for the testing because we want to see what your baseline is like off medications. Has, that is our marker. Does your baseline change over time? So what are the outcomes? We look at feasibility, look at safety. Clinical measures, these are not powered to determine whether it works. The first question that the person in the elevator asks when they said they learned that we've been doing it, does it work? Well, we're working on that. That's, that's why we, we will have to get to a larger randomized double-blind multi-center trial before we convince people completely that it's working. It may not work, I don't know, but I think this is our best shot and I'm willing to put all my time and energy and mental capacity and emotions into it. Um, biomarkers. What other clues do we have that this might be working? And I'll show you some imaging from that. And unfortunately, we have had uh, a couple of patients who have passed away 
from other causes um, who have donated their brains for histological evaluation. And I will show you some of the evidence that we've seen from there. So it's kind of a trial with a lot of moving parts to it. Who would want to do this? Well, we looked at that. We had 21 subjects uh, who enrolled. So the enrollment was not very difficult. We had three people who dropped out for various reasons on their own accord that said other issues came up and they said either time-wise or whatever. I said, I, maybe I, I don't want to do it. Okay. So we had 18 that went on, implanted bilateral deep brain stimulation. Those 18 all received an implant of a unilateral graft. And then we've got uh, one, one subject who passed away and at 12 months, two subjects were unable to make that study follow-up visit. So part of the feasibility is if we do this, are patients able to come back in and actually do the testing? Because if we implanted everybody and they couldn't make it back for whatever reason, we don't have the data and it's not a good study design. So part of all of this to go through this is evaluating the study design. How difficult is it? Because if we think that we want to go to the next phase, is, it, is that reasonable? You know, did we have to go through 100 patients just to get 20, right? And that's really not, has not been the case for us. So we were able to evaluate 15 at the end of 12 months, and we were able to, the other patients, even after the two years, we still can ask them to participate, even though we closed out that part of the study, will you come back each year? And can we look at your scores again? Because this is, we're not taking it out, it's in, and what can we do to help you know, get more information, get the data, is this a good idea or not? So here's some of the clinical data that we capture. Uh, a lot of it is off of the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, a scale that was designed to capture the Parkinson's symptoms as much as possible from part one, mood and cognition, part two, activities of daily living, part three is that motor exam which is a, a big part for us of the most objective measure, even though there's some subjective parts of it, but it's as objective as we can get. And then part four, complications of medication, dystonias, dyskinesias, fluctuations, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, things like that. So we capture all of that. So again, we were, this table is full. We were able to capture that data, right? And this, is, this represents out to 12 months, but that goes out to two years as well. So we have been, uh, we feel that that's very, been a very successful component. Patients are compliant, they make their visits, they come back for their study visits. Feasibility, we went through that whole process. Of can, can we, it's not gonna mean a hill of beans if we put these graphs in and they don't end up where we want them to be. What does that mean? Okay, you got your graph, but it's not where, it, where it's supposed to be. So, with our imaging, we can go in and we can see where, we, where the trajectory was. Did we hit our target? And we can determine the trajectory of that pass. I can't prove that the graft is there. I don't have a good way, I don't have any imaging at this point to say, did the graft actually come out of the cannula and is it sitting exactly where is there? I don't have a way to see it. It's one of the limitations of what we do. It's one of the limitations of, anyway, unless you put in some marker. And we're working on that. We have a couple of ideas. But based on the trajectory and where we wanted to put the graph, and we have some clues that it looks like that's where it is, we can map that out for each patient. And so for each patient, I can draw a representation of the, subs uh, the um, substantia nigra, the red nucleus, and STN, subthalamic nucleus. And I can put those into three different orientations, anterior, posterior, medial, lateral, dorsal, ventral. And I can look at that and I can say, yeah, if, if that green dot where the graft is supposed to be, if that's in the blue area, then I got my graft where I wanted it to be. So what if we do that for all patients? And we get a table that looks like this. So we can go through each one so where is the graft? And now, with the advanced imaging and analysis, where in that substantia nigra is it? And does it make a difference 
if it's a little bit more in the front or in the back? Is there more of a motor component in the back? Is there more of a associative or a speech area that's maybe a cognitive area that's more anterior? There may be, but we can begin to look at that. But can we hit our target? We can. So in terms of summary for feasibility, recruitment is not a problem. Deep brain stimulation, all participants received DBS therapy. Nobody went to the operating room and said, oh, that's not, that's, it didn't work. We designed it so that patients get their deep brain stimulation procedure first. We didn't want the grafting procedure to interfere with the ability to get the DBS because that's why you're there in the first place. That's why it's DBS plus. It's an add-on. So all patients were able to get their DBS and all patients got their DBS therapy. All participants received a graft. We did not have any patient that came in after, uh, for their stage two. Oh, we couldn't find the graft. Oh, there's not enough tissue. Well, we had plenty of tissue and we could find the graft and everybody got one. Placements. As I just showed you, all graft trajectories were within the substantia nigra region. Okay? So I feel very comfortable about saying that this part of it uh, is feasible. Safety, adverse events. All adverse events, like in any clinical trial when you first start, capture everything. The patient gets a the flu. They sprain their ankle. Oh, we better record that. Is it related to the surgery? Is it related to the procedure? Is it related to DBS? Is it related to Parkinson's? We have to go through that and assign that to everyone. <coughs> it's a lot of work. George Cantero, our uh, clinical trials coordinator and guru, uh, is in charge of that with, with his team. It's, it's quite extensive and there are a lot of notebooks with a lot of any adverse events. But we need to capture that. Can we see if there's anything that might be related? So what do we see? We've had a few patients who've had some superficial cellulitis infections where we took the graft from the ankle. That's related to the grafting procedure. Treated with antibiotics, went away. No, nothing serious, no serious adverse events. Related to the grafting or the grafting procedure. The main profile is basically that of what you see with deep brain stimulation which I think is important. We also looked at the cognitive data. We don't have any additional cognitive deficits from this procedure. Patients are getting two electrodes into one area of the brain. We're going into another area with another pass. Well, it, how many times can you do that before you, and believe me, you worry about it. We, how many sleepless nights before we did the first one? Are we gonna, are we gonna cause a problem, right? And I'm more than pleasantly surprised by the lack of any significant issues related to the procedure, whether we've done it unilaterally or bilaterally. And there's actually more to that story to come on because there may be some trending to improvement in some of the other areas where you typically see some deficits with deep brain stimulation, you said the verbal fluency, but with the grafting procedure, we don't see it, even though they've gotten the full DBS. I can't make too much of it. The numbers are small, but it's certainly not going in the wrong direction. Okay. Clinical outcome data. I talked about the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. As I said, it's a clinical exam. It tests what we call the cardinal feature, features of Parkinson's disease. Bradykinesia. If you don't have slowness, if you don't have bradykinesia, you can't be considered to have Parkinson's disease. It is like the most significant hallmark feature of Parkinson's. It's on the Movement Disorder Society upgraded list for diagnosing Parkinson's. If you don't have Parkinson's, it's an exclusionary criteria. If you don't have slowness, if you don't have bradykinesia, you don't have Parkinson's disease, what is called clinically established. Not gonna happen. So we can test for slowness, we can test for rigidity, tremor, and gait and balance issues. It picks up a few other things along the way. There are 27 left-hand corner features on this exam, right? And so when you, take, you do this exam, 
patients are rated, if you are normal, I'm considering myself normal, like, but maybe just for this part of it, the other parts of me are not normal. But this part, okay, so I can, my movement is normal, I get a zero. If it's as bad as it can be and I can't even really open up my hand, right? That's a four. So zero, one, two, three, four, everything gets rated. Right hand, left hand, leg, leg, speech, facial expression, gait, balance, all of that is there. And so it goes into a big spreadsheet and we talk about it. What is your UPDRS score? Oh, I got a 39. Well, what does that mean? You may have a 39 and you may have a 39, but you may be tremoring and you may have rigidity. Doesn't really tell me a whole lot. You can break it down into subscores. So I'm a visual kind of person, so I'm struggling with just this looking at spreadsheets. So I said, can we come up with a better way to look at our data, data visualization? All these exams just look at different body parts. Why don't we just break it down like that, right? So we call this the, anybody play Tetris? No, or know the game, the video game Tetris? So we call this the, the Tetris person, right? It means it looks like a game of Tetris. And each box represents one of the exams and it's color coded. So white is zero, yellow is one, uh, slight, right? Yellow is slight. Orange, mild, red, moderate, and then a maroon color, which I don't think there's any maroon on here. That's a four, severe. So on the left is the patient off medication with their scores, color-coded. Now I can look at that and go, oh, looks like the left arm is a problem, maybe on the right foot, uh, left foot, uh, and there's some, uh, maybe some gait and balance things going on. But not too bad. Now we give the patient medication. So that was their off score. That's their baseline. You, give them, you can give them medication or you can give them deep brain stimulation or in this case, 24 months with just a graft. We turn the medications off. We turn the stimulation off. We can check baseline to baseline. So that's the middle panel. What has changed, right? And then we can look, right, you can look at it and go, oh, I see it. And we made it even easier, I right, think it's easier. On this right-hand side, that's the change in the score. So green, blue, and dark blue is good, is improvement. Yellow is slight worsening. Orange would be even worse than that. But you can look at that pretty quickly and go, oh, on the left grafted side, that's where the most of the improvements occurred. So that helps us out, I think. We can break it down, as I said, into subscore. We can reorganize those boxes. So we can look at facial expression and speech. We can look at tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia as each of their own subscores, gait and balance. And on the bottom, we can actually look at the left and right, where there's a left and a right score. And we can do that for everybody, okay? Practically, though, this is much more difficult to, to look at and extract everything and go, oh, man, I don't, yeah. yeah, okay. But patient to patient, we think it's helpful, and we're looking at other tools to be able to look at composite scores. But that's, oh, and then the numbers. So for the patients who went through this at 24 months, significant, statistically significant improvements, bradykinesia, Rigidity, tremor, contralateral versus ipsilateral. I told you that we put the graphs on one side of the body. Does it, the brain, right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, right? So if I put the graph on, the, we put the graph on the most affected side. So did the symptoms get better on the other side compared to the other, to the non-grafted side? They did. Okay. Another clue, another piece of the puzzle. I can't prove that yet, but it's a piece of puzzle. Um, what about overall, what about change from baseline? We don't have strict control groups, but we can compare a patient from where they were at baseline to where they were two years later. And so if you look at all the patients combined together in the pink, purpley pink down at the bottom, the lower score is an improvement 
change in baseline. Their scores dropped. They got better by about eight points. Here it looks more like nine. We had a group, what is the control group here in the black line? Why is the black line going up? That is a group of patients right. who, I told you that some patients do get cognitive issues. So we had a trial arm where we took the graft and we put it into a different location of the brain to see if it might help with memory, cognition changes. The way we had the protocol, they could not get the graft into the motor part, but they got a graft. So we have five patients who got a graft, just like the other ones did, but it's in a different part of the brain. How did they do? That's their motor scores. Their motor scores got worse. Another piece to the puzzle. On the right-hand side, does this correlate with anything? So we test patients before they come in for their surgery, off medication and on medication. How well do you respond to your Cinemat? The only thing you need to look at this graph here, it looks like there's a diagonal grouping, right? So what is correlating with what? The patients who responded best to their Cinemat. So if you had a 50 off your medication, you take your medication, you get a 25, it's about a 50% improvement, it's pretty good. That's a good responder. So if you didn't have it quite as much, where do you fall out on this curve? So the patients who had the best response tended to have the best response to the graft. Okay, Another piece to the puzzle. What if we had other controls? What about some patients who did not get DBS, but we have their baseline data over a year? Right? Or patients who did get DBS from previous surgeries. We have some of their data that were not part of the trial, but we have the data. Well, let's look at it. So on the left-hand side, how is this graph put together? If you're white, if you get a white bar, each bar is a patient. Right? And it represents what happens after that year. Do you go up or down? So if you're really with five points up, five points down, really not a big change, you get a white bar. If you get worse, you get a red bar, more than five. If you get better, you get a blue bar. So again, is, is the data perfect though? There's always gonna be some noise in the data. But if you look at the left-hand side, versus the right-hand side, all that right-hand side from that black line, those are the patients who got a graft, okay? Again, just visualizing, looking at it, that group looks different than the other one. And it looks like there's a lot more blue and a lot less red, okay? Another piece to the puzzle. So, imaging, biomarkers. Do we have any way of looking inside the brain with imaging to tell us what might be going on? And I won't go into too much of this here. This is just emerging, partly because of the difficulty in quantifying this data. They, even the company that generated the software calls it semi-quantitative. It generates a fuzzy picture, and if I want to take that fuzzy picture and integrate it into a really clear picture, they're really not good tools for that. And they had one glitch in the system that wouldn't even let us bring it in to, to do that overlay. Just last week, we figured that out. Uh, we, Trip Hines, uh, figured that out, put a lot of work and energy into it. He's our, our brain mapping wizard. Um, but these are what are called DAT scans, kind of dopamine transporter. You can give a patient a tracer, and that tracer will bind to dopamine nerve terminals. So I can look at that, and if it binds on with that radioactive tracer, it will produce a hot spot on an image. And so on the left, a patient who has essential tremor, their dopaminergic system is intact in that caudate and putamen region. You kind of get these two comma-shaped, bean-shaped structures, caudate in the top, putamen at the bottom. For a patient who has Parkinson's disease, that is diminished. That hot, is no longer a hot spot. There's a little bit of a hot spot there, but that's in the caudate. Most of the, what we see the degeneration for for Parkinson's is in, is in the putamen. As I said, 
specifically quantifying that, being able to look at where those structures are, is we just kind of cracked that code. We can look at those anatomical structures for that patient on the left with the MRI and the anatomical reconstruction, and now we can finally map that DAT scan data into that space, just like we did with the CT scan for our deep brain stimulation. We can register that up, we can see exactly where those hot spots are, and we can look at for patients who have had the graft, does that change in that area or does it not? Again, is this gonna be perfect data? We don't know, but we need to, we need to look at it. How's it going? Um, and this is kind of what's interesting about this view. Again, you can do the cutaway view with a top-down view from the patient's skull, and you can see the two bars. Those are the deep brain artifacts of the deep brain stimulating electrodes that go in. Okay, so we can take that data. Where are the electrodes? Where are the hotspots? Has anything changed? And yes, we have the data for all those patients before and after. So someone's got a lot of work to do. <laughs> But, uh, but we're, we're working on it. Um, and finally, histology. Um, one patient passed away, donated his brain after two years and nine months. Um, we look at the integrity of the brain within that system. So the cells on that left does not look highly disrupted, looks fairly well integrated. And we see some fiber staining in those other two areas. What if we look at the grafted side and the non-grafted side in the substantia nigra? A little bit tough to tell, but the two panels on the left versus the two panels on the right, the left side is the grafted side and the right side is the non-grafted side. A little bit, the side on the left is staining for dopaminergic neurons. A little bit darker, a little bit more fiber density, okay? And finally, there's another kind of close-up view. Finally, um, the question is, well, you put these graphs in, how do we know that they're surviving? So in this patient, we had a stain. So in the green, we're staining for tyrosine hydroxylase, a marker for dopamine neurons. Stain for red, a specific marker for the Schwann cells. And blue is a nuclear study for just kind of generally stains nuclear, you know, cellular material in the area. But I see red in there, right? So we have evidence that we have cell survival at two years and nine months of the grafts that are put in. There are some stem cell studies, you put in the stem cells, we know that they die, they, pa they, they don't survive even past 48 hours, okay? So, all about science and targeting and everything else. Here's a video. If I can get this to, oh. Now, if we can get that to play, that's, oh, there we go. We were asking him to stand up out of the chair. You can see him, he's off, off medications, yeah. Very stiff, difficult to walk. His left foot is turned in. You can see this tremor really start to come out right there, okay? Six months after the surgery, off medication, off stimulation, okay? So that's six months. We've seen him now at four years later. Somebody sent me something through Facebook. We can turn the lights back on if you like. Um, sent me this picture. That's him. It's our friend Bill Crawford on a slum ski. He's had Parkinson's for 15 years. As she said, how cool is that? Right? So I know I've gotten way over my time. Uh, future directions, where else are we going with this? We can take that nerve tissue and we can do a lot of things with it. 
one of the things that I think is really cool. Transplanting something from one being, person, to another is, is really tricky business because if it's not a good match, your body's going to reject it. And it's the immune system that rejects it. But what if you didn't have an immune system? We have a rat, in the, right, that does not, is bred to not have an immune system. So we can put human tissue into that rat and it won't be rejected. So we can start to ask questions from our graphs. What are they doing? What are they doing inside the brain, inside brain tissue? If we want them to interact with something else, we can use that in the laboratory to find out some of those questions. We've got more with the DBS plus, additional targets. Do we need more tissue? Are we in the right location? RNA sequencing. One of the things that we're expanding on right now is we're teaming up with a lab that studies the axolotl salamander. Okay. Um, if you cut a limb off of that salamander, it will regrow the entire limb. Right? Pretty cool. Um, if you, at the same time, you cut that limb off, but you go up a little bit higher and you cut the nerve so it doesn't have the nerve innervation, it won't do it. So again, another clue to something going on with this peripheral nerve tissue, regulating regeneration. So a lot are known about salamander genes. One of the things that's cool about this, salamander, that salamander has 10 times the genome of human beings. A little tiny salamander, you know, oh, what are they all doing? Right. But it can regrow a limb. It's, there's something in there, right? So we can, we can look at that. Um, we've got more histology. We can take a look and do other things in the laboratory with, these, uh, with the grass. We can put them in a dish and we can grow them and ask additional questions. What else can we do with those? So we've got a lot of things that we can do. So overall, there's, my view is that there's hope. I haven't proved anything except maybe safety and feasibility components. We have core support from our university. We have patients who are passionate and beyond committed, right? And we have very generous philanthropic support. We are not a company. We don't have patents, right? But I'm not interested in forming either one of those. Uh, what we do is based on what we can get in grant money, but mostly what we're getting from philanthropy, which we're uh, eternally grateful. Uh, Kenny and Lisa Trout from the Dallas area, Doug McClay, Harriet, the McClay family has been very generous. Doug's a, a patient. It's like the hair club for men. Not only is 